Hello and welcome to The Exchange. I'm Diane Buckner. Canada's plan to bring in 25,000 Syrian refugees presents a massive logistical and economic challenge. They'll have to be identified, screened for security and health issues, transported to Canada, processed and eventually settled into our society. But how to manage all that remains a bit of a mystery. Where will they go exactly? What, where will they live? What about jobs, health care? And how will Canada's economy cope with the influx? There's still a lot to be sorted out. One thing the federal government says is clear at this point is the cost, $678 million over six years. And that doesn't include any help it may provide for the provinces. Canada's plan now calls for 10,000 refugees to be privately sponsored, with the government sponsoring the remaining 15,000. Canada has a long history of taking in large numbers of refugees. In 1956, we welcomed 37,000 Hungarians in a single year. In the 1970s, 60,000 Vietnamese people found a new home here. Thousands more arrived from Uganda in 1972, and in the late 90s, thousands fled Kosovo and settled in Canada. Those arrivals have helped Canada's economy prosper in the past, but today there are even bigger challenges. Statistics Canada recently reported that Canada's annual population growth had slowed to less than 1% last year, mostly because fewer immigrants came to this country. That's worrying because immigration has been the main driver of Canada's population growth, accounting for 60% of that growth last year. And Canada's population is aging quickly. The portion of the population over 60 65 grew four times faster than Canada's overall population. Shana Plout is a research fellow at the School of International Studies in, at Simon Fraser University. So what would you say to people who are very concerned about so many immigrants coming in such a short period of time? Should they be worried about Canada's economy? Sure. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak about this issue. One of the things that I'd like for us to be able to do is to actually look down to our neighbors in the south regarding um, the economic benefits that refugees give to the economy. And I'm specifically thinking about Buffalo, New York, Utica, New York, as well as St. Louis, Missouri. These were uh, pop, uh, towns and cities that had been economically devastated. Um, they were part of the Rust Belt. And when those economies went down, the population fled as well. And one of the ways that these, country, uh, these cities, pardon me, have been able to revitalize is actually asking the government to bring in refugees for the purpose of revitalization. Yeah, and of course today we saw uh, Quebec talking about the number they were going to take, Atlanta, Canada, saying we would like uh, some of the refugees. It seems surprising in some ways because on the other hand, people are quite concerned about it. I mean, when we think about this incredible process that's going to have to happen for these people arriving in Canada, how robust are the agencies and the centers that are supposed to help them integrate into their new home? Sure. Well, for one thing, I'd like to be able to reframe this and not just a position of integrating them into the new home, but also integrating the dominant populations to recognizing the new uh, people who are coming in. And I'm a bit concerned that the conversation has only been uh, looking at the social service agencies and the federal government and the provincial governments, particularly here in BC where I am, we have to also understand that we're on unceded territory of from many First Nations. And so being able to have a conversation with all the various actors that are involved and to be able to see how this is going to be able to be a benefit and do it in a proactive as opposed to a reactive manner is extraordinarily important. Uh, now, what do we know about the people who are coming to Canada at this point? Point. Probably not much, but from your work in this area, how employable are they going to be? Sure. Well, actually, the people who are coming specifically in terms of the Syrian refugees, and this is by no means the only refugees that are coming, but we're speaking about the specific population. These are a very well-screened population. Most likely, these are people who have actually been in refugee camps uh, for a number of years in Lebanon, in Turkey. We're talking about predominantly middle class. We're talking about predominantly professional class. So we're talking about the same medical professionals, educational professionals, engineers, um, and skilled tradesmen that we often will pay a northern living allowance so that people will go up north in order to go. These are people already coming with those skills. And these are well vetted people because again, they have most likely been in the refugee camps for quite a while. 
So they're known not only through the UNHCR process and the Canadian security process, but also through the society that they've created in these refugee camps. Now again, I'd, I'd like to go back to this from an economic standpoint. We're talking about people with the skills that we are often seeking to be able to bring up to northern Canada or to other areas um, that aren't the major population centers. So as soon as we can have these folks stabilized, and I'm quoting here from the Vancouver area of survivors of torture, is a three-tier process usually in terms of what refugees go through. Number one is that stabilization process. It is being able to have housing, to be able to have health care, to be able to just be kind of a Maslow hierarchy of needs. Number two is a mourning process. And then number three is a reemergence process. So what we're doing actually is we're investing in people in order to enable them to reemerge into the people that they already are and then be able to contribute to the society that they're going into. When you talk about doctors and other professionals, there could be also accreditation issues though, would there not be? Absolutely. And since we are talking about a specific refugee population, this also needs to be considered when we're bringing in this particular demographic of folks. So this is, again, not the uh, overall refugee population that usually uh, gets brought in annually. This is specifically demarcated with specific provisions. And this is what I mean about taking a proactive stance. So recognizing the demographics of these uh, people and these individuals, and then being able to wa uh, work in those accreditation processes those language processes into this um, large-scale program that we're seeing uh, going on. And then what about their destinations? I mean, we're you're talking about northern locations and trying to send people to where they're perhaps most needed, as you're talking about mm -hmm. the Rust Belt and so forth. Uh, I mean, there has, has there been any discussion of that so far that you've heard of in terms of the, the policy that's going to be applied to these particular people? Sure. Well, when I was speaking of the Rust Belt, I'm speaking specifically in the United States. Um, and there we, we've seen, again, cities in Buffalo, New York, Utica, New right. York, St. Louis. But when we're talking about in Canada, there actually was, um, in the original plan for British Columbia, which is where I am right now, um, there was actually, a, because of the cost of living, a a desire to be able to resettle folks up north and there was also a, a backlash there again because of this misunderstanding of refugees being an economic drain as opposed to actually being an asset in the long run so where we know of right now in terms of the refugee resettlement is that refugees will be coming to the major metropolitan areas there's 30 uh, 32 to 36 destinations that have already been allocated and that's where they're going to be uh, uh, resettled first. But then they are coming as refugees, which means they're coming as permanent residents. So they have free movement to be able to go anywhere in the country that's going to be able to work best for them and their families. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Shana Plout. We really appreciate it. Thank you.